Y'all sent in some software engineering questions, so let's try to answer them. How is AI going to impact beginner programmers and what jobs are most likely to be affected? So as far as the impact of AI, I think AI is going to impact absolutely everything, but not in the sense of like replacing all of our jobs, but just in the sense of changing the job and giving us new tools that allow us to be more efficient. But as far as AI actually replacing any jobs, I think we are much further away than most people think. For example, there was a study done by researchers at Princeton and the University of Chicago, where instead of just giving AI arbitrary coding problems, they gave it actual GitHub issues. And what they found after giving AI over 2,000 issues is that it was able to solve less than 5% of them, and the ones it was able to solve were extremely trivial. So effectively, it was able to do nearly no actual software development work. So for the time being, I wouldn't lose any sleep over the idea of AI replacing any jobs because I don't think it's going to be happening anytime soon. But rather, as a beginner, I would recognize that AI is actually a great tool you can be using to learn how to code much more efficiently. And actually, I think we're still at the very early stages of finding ways to use AI to make learning more efficient, so I am looking forward to seeing how that progresses over time. Should I freelance or get a tech job first? I'd say just do whichever one's more interesting to you. One is not like a prerequisite to the other. You don't need to be a freelancer before you can get a tech job. You don't need a tech job before you can be a freelancer. So if your goal is to be a freelancer, go freelance. If your goal is to get a job in big tech, then go try to get a job in big tech. Of course, if you're sort of struggling to get that job in big tech, you could do some freelancing in the meantime just to generate some income and potentially improve your resume, but don't see like one as a prereq to the other. What was work-life balance like at Meta? What were the expectations regarding working hours? Were you expected to work longer if you had things to do? And was it looked down upon if you weren't staying late every day? So this can vary from team to team, and it's just going to depend a lot on your particular situation, but I can give you at least my personal experience Experience. So as far as work-life balance, in my case, it was pretty good. I rarely worked over 40 hours a week. In fact, most of the time I worked like 30 to 35 hours in a given week. So you're not clocking in, nobody's tracking your hours, and honestly, nobody really cares what time you're working as long as you're getting your work done, with the one caveat being that you're expected to be at meetings on occasion, and usually those are between like the hours of 10 and 5. So most people's workday is probably roughly like 9 to 5 or 10 to 6 or something like that. And yeah, if you have some deadline coming up, there's a good chance you're going to be working a little bit more that week, but that's sort of made up in other times when there's not a whole lot going on and you might work a little bit less that week. And there's also things like on-call. So most teams have one person at any given moment, sometimes two people who are on-call. So if a service goes down or something like that at any time, they're the person who's sort of in charge of trying to fix it or triage it to whoever can fix it. As far as being looked down upon if you're not staying late, I never saw this happening. Maybe there's individuals who might be doing this, but for the most part, I never saw this sort of toxic mindset. And honestly, half the time I left the office at like 3 p.m. if I had nothing left to do that day. Where'd you learn how to code and what was the best method for teaching for you? So I went to the University of Washington, go dogs. And I'd say the best method in my opinion is not a single method, but having multiple methods. So sort of absorbing information in multiple different mediums. So this is going to lectures or watching videos, as well as practicing on your own with sort of tutorial projects and practicing with bigger projects on your own. And and also doing things like asking questions, whether it be to a teaching assistant or even to like AI. So essentially, I think the best method is a mixture of all the methods. This person has three questions, so I'll answer them one at a time. When interviewing junior engineers, do most companies do system design interviews? No, most of them don't. There are maybe some exceptions, but the vast majority of companies don't do system design for junior or like new grad positions. I come from a QA background, but I've been coding for over 10 years as a test automation engineer slash software development engineer in test work, but I've been doing software development engineering work for almost three years. Does my 10 plus years SDEC count as SDE work or just my almost three years SDE? So it depends on what exactly you mean by count. If you're just referring to like, how many years of experience do you have for like applying to new jobs? It's probably somewhere in between. It's not like that time as a software development engineering test isn't going to count at all, but it's also not going to be the equivalent as doing software engineering work that entire time. So it's probably seen roughly as somewhere in between, but I'm not a recruiter and it's probably going to depend on the individual company and the individual recruiter or hiring manager looking at your resume. What tasks are software engineers using AI in their dev work? So it can vary a lot from engineer to engineer and company to company. Some companies have basically completely outlawed AI saying you can't use it at all, whether it be because they're concerned about the actual correctness of it or they're concerned about copyright issues or something like that. 
but then there's also companies that are encouraging it. And then on the individual level, some people just don't trust it and others are using it a lot. So it varies a lot from person to person. In my own case, I'm using it for things like writing helper functions and writing tests, as well as a lot of stuff that I would before be Googling and going somewhere like Stack Overflow. I'm just asking to GPT. And then I usually get a more specific answer to my actual question instead of some generic 10 year old answer in Stack Overflow. But I'm certainly not using it to write entire components or web services or anything like that. And I wouldn't recommend you do it either. I know the basics of JS and Python. Which one should I learn further? Well, it doesn't really matter. Learn whatever's interesting to you. If you want to do something like web development, I would learn more JavaScript. If you want to do something to do with AI or machine learning or data or something like that, Python might be a better avenue. But generally speaking, I would focus less on individual programming languages and more so on just developing good software development fundamentals that can be translated into any language. What is the fastest way to learn to code for a beginner? So I wouldn't even think about it in terms of learn to code because honestly, I don't even know what that means. What is the definition of learn to code? At what point have you learned how to code? I would instead think of it as more of what is the fastest way to learn X, how to do whatever the thing is you're actually trying to do because code is just a tool. It is a means to an end towards building things. It also depends on your individual situation. For some people, it's going to be going to a coding bootcamp. For other people, it's going to be taking computer science classes at universities. And for other people, it's going to be taking online courses. It just depends on how you learn as an individual and your personal situation. I'd also push back a little bit on the idea of trying to learn as fast as you can and maybe more prioritize trying to learn as best as you can to set yourself up for the most long-term success. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? So this one is difficult. There's no like one answer that's going to work for everybody. And unfortunately, pretty much everybody's affected by it. But I actually found that knowing that pretty much everybody's affected by it actually sort of helps in dealing with it when you recognize that, okay, everybody around me is feeling the same thing as me. And that means none of these people know nearly as much as I think they know. And they probably don't expect me to know nearly as much as I think they expect me to know. And I also think it's important to just celebrate your own achievements and recognize that you are doing good work. And I think doing this can help just because it gives you an objective mindset of saying, okay, look, I am actually doing the thing and I'm doing it well. And that sort of contradicts the idea of imposter syndrome of like, oh no, I don't know anything. And at least personally, I found that pretty helpful. This one also has a few different questions. So we'll do them one at a time. What's the best Best way to get into cybersecurity end goal of making it a career? Honestly, I don't know. I'm not the right person to ask. I've never done cybersecurity, so can't really answer that one. How secure is the job market for new devs right now? And or what can we do to increase our chances of getting a job? So as far as the job market, I would say it's in a worse place than it was like three, four years ago, but probably in a better place than it was like a year ago. So I guess it's sort of all relative, but it's hard to like quantify the exact position that the market's in right now. And even if you could, I don't know that it matters that much because there's not much you can do about it, right? Like you are in the market you're in, knowing the exact state of the market probably won't actually change the way you approach getting a job. But as far as how to increase your chances, I would break it down into two main categories. The first one is getting interviews and the second one is passing interviews. So for getting interviews, pretty much the only thing that matters is your resume. Now that encompasses things like projects, but just generally speaking, the resume is what they're using to decide if you get interviews. So if you find you're not getting interviews at all, work on the resume a lot, make it the absolute best document you've ever made in your entire life and try to get a lot of feedback from different people who are actually going to be critical of it and give you helpful advice. And then number two is passing the coding interviews, which is pretty self-explanatory. You just need to study for these and get a lot of good practice. And I'm not going to go too in depth on this because I have like 20 videos on it on this channel, but just generally speaking, step two is getting good at coding interviews. Least favorite programming language you've used. I mean, honestly, the generic answer to this is there's not like a best or worst language. It doesn't really matter. It's just about using the right language for the given job. But if you just mean which ones have I used and not enjoyed using very much, it's probably going to be some of the math and stats languages like R and MATLAB. That's not to say they're bad languages, they do their job, but personally, they don't really align with like the type of work I like doing. How'd you learn to code and what were your projects when you got your first job? So I had a lot of phases where I sort of learned how to code, but I'd say I like officially started learning how to code when I took AP computer science in high school. And then when I went to university and obviously took a lot of computer science classes there. So that's sort of how I learned how to code. As far as projects on your resume, I had a few like hackathon projects, but nothing super impressive on my resume. I think the more important thing on my resume when I got my first job, or in my case, my first internship was the fact that I'd been a teaching assistant for the computer science department, which is sort of a way of showcasing that somebody else had vouched for my knowledge and expertise in this area. Which from a programming perspective is better, game dev or web dev? By programming perspective, I mean like based on the languages you learn and the syntax used in each. 
So I don't think it really matters. I think the thing that's most important is to do things that are interesting to you. If you're interested in game development, then game development can be a great way to learn how to code. If you're interested in building websites, web development can be a great way to learn how to code. If you're interested in either of those, there's also lots of other avenues you can go. But the fundamental core concepts of programming are essentially the same in all of these. What are the qualities of a good software developer? I love this question. So I have a few ones in mind. The first one is going to be open-mindedness. So I would almost define this as the willingness to go into any meeting or code review or design review or whatever it might be with the expectation of being wrong and being proven that there is a better solution than the one you already have. I also think logical thinking is an important skill and just the ability to sort of separate your emotions from the actual facts and to just use reasoning to make good decisions. Another important one is going to be communication. So the ability to articulate your solutions, to articulate your thought process, and to sort of showcase your work to other people. And the last one I'd say is being a self-motivated person, but at the same time, being somebody who's humble enough to be able to say, I don't know how to do this and to know when it's the right time to go ask somebody else for help. What are the best industry practices while making a website, especially in React and Next for production level build because many devs can make a website, but what differentiates it from the production level build? So the short answer is honestly not that much. Code is code. However, I do think there are a lot of things that in sort of personal projects tend to get overlooked that become more and more important in larger sort of production systems. For example, there's usually a much bigger emphasis on testing, both with manual testing as well as automation testing, and even testing for things like security, because the last thing you want is to be part of some big data leak. There's also something to be said for the scalability of the code base and just how well it's organized and things like that. I think a good test for this is to ask yourself, if somebody new came into this code base, how easy would it be for them to understand it? How long would it take them to become productive? And in a production code base, hopefully that time is going to be less because it's going to be well documented and just well organized. You also see a lot of performance optimizations with things like server-side rendering and code splitting and caching and all of these different things that you can do to make a website more performant and to load faster for lots of different users, regardless of sort of what types of connections they're using to get to your website. The last thing I'd say is production projects tend to have more work done in things like continuous integration and continuous deployment to make the code base just easier to work in as well as safer to work in. And with this, you also tend to implement things like monitoring and analytics to keep track of what is and isn't working and if things ever go down. What is your advice to a first year computer science student? So the first thing I'd say is avoid taking too many coding classes at once, especially ones using different languages. The worst thing is when you have three different projects due on the same day and one is a Java project, one's a C++ project, and the other is a web development project. It just is a lot to sort of wrap your brain around at once. I think it sort of hurts the learning process. I'd also say to try to work on some projects outside of school projects. And a good way to do this is with hackathons, just because they allow you to do this very quickly without any long-term time commitments. Another thing is if you want to be applying to internships, try to take data structures and algorithms as early as you can, because it's basically a prerequisite to the coding interview process. Also try to go to office hours and get to know your professors and your teaching assistants. You'd be surprised how much more you learn if you do this and how many good connections you build for the long-term that can help you get jobs and things done the line. And the most important piece of advice for college students is honestly just have some fun. Try not to stress too much. <laughs> you have your whole life to stress. Try to just take it one step at a time. Can you get a Nobel Prize if you learn computer science? I mean, I guess it's possible, but the primary prize in computing is known as the Turing Award, and it is extremely prestigious, sort of known as the Nobel Prize of computing. But just know it's extremely hard to get. It usually goes to academics or people with extreme impact on the industry. For example, the last person to get it was literally the inventor of ethernet. So high bar, but I guess it's possible. Somebody has to win it every year. Another super common question I get asked is what programming projects should I work on? And if you're wondering that, you should watch this video next. Additionally, let me know what other questions you have down in the comments and maybe we can turn this into a series.